And for more on healthcare tech, I'm joined by Serena Xiao, head of healthcare research China at Credit Suisse, and Robert Royer, a co-founder and CEO of Starcadia Asia. Thank you both for joining us today. Rob, I want to kick it off with you. Talk about what your company is working on, the technology to allow patients, or potential patients, I should say, to detect tumor tissue development early on. Tell us how it works. Yeah, thank you, Sherry. We're really excited to be introducing for the first time globally the first metabolic screening system for breast cancer awareness. This is a technology that you can wear in the privacy of your own home while you're working today or while you're working out or even sleeping, where over a few hours of time period, we have very accurate algorithms based upon a number of patients, over, over 300 now at this point, that we have inserted into a database that gives you a very quick feedback that says, your breast health is fantastic, please go on and let's screen again. Or if there is an alert, your physician can actually be notified immediately. So finding cancers early, we're really shifting the quality of care from the institution out to the population and delivering peace of mind. So this is a good example of what we're trying to address in this conversation, basically applying technology to healthcare, finding business opportunities, perhaps sort of expand the horizon on this front. But Tell us how your technology, sort of going beyond this IT broad technology, how will that really benefit patients down the road? Yeah. The reality is that we're shifting uh, the distribution of the information. We are coming to you as the individual. Today, 85% of women in Asia have no idea of family history, but yet are getting cancer. 14% of the women's cancers are happening under age 40. In both, in both places, it's like a lightning bolt out of the blue. So our technology is here to find cancers earlier. The average cancer that is found is found by a woman, and that's uh, usually a one and a half centimeter tumor. We know that based upon our studies, we're finding when tissue is invaded, much earlier stages of cancer, and most importantly, we then can feed that individual into the healthcare continuum to really work and ensure that we have a better outcome a much higher chance of survival at a much lower cost. And I mean, you're the experts, but I would imagine your company's technology has some implications for wearables uh, down the road as well. But Serena, I want to bring you in. Let's talk about the size of this market to get the conversation really going here. Because, you know, as healthcare sector is being sort of reshaped by all these new technological buzzwords, do you see the difference in terms of the size of investment? Oh, for, for sure. Uh, this is a huge market potential over there. So uh, especially in China, I think uh, a lot of uh, diseases um, like cancer, like other uh, chronic diseases is under treatment uh, because of, you know, uh, less diagnosed. So basically the technology uh, that Rob's company developing is really help. Um, first, you have to have uh, uh, diagnosed tours and then you have to put the, these patients uh, into the treatment. So the, the diagnos diagnosis itself, the market, is, it's, it's huge. Can you put a number to this? Um, I couldn't come up with an exact uh, investment number, but uh, I think the overall penetration uh, ratio, I, I believe, in China now for different kinds of diagnosis is less than 5%. Well, I think penetration is really the key word, especially in markets yeah. like China. And I'm glad that you brought in the China angle. And obviously, that's really the market that seems to play a big role, especially when it comes to AI development. Uh, what is really the role of Asia and China in terms of healthcare tech? Um, so we've just talked about the diagnosis. Uh, I think that's a big area. China can play a very big role because we have the largest population. And for a lot of diseases, uh, we have big enough database, right? Uh, for some, especially for some rare diseases in the Western world. But in China, we have millions of patients here. So that's a very uh, precious uh, data, I think, can contributing to the uh, whole technology development in the future. 
Yeah, I think that's that. that I think that's one single uh, largest uh, China's advantage here. Well, the data, the yes. amount of data. What's the gauge that you're getting, Rob, as uh, you know, as a person who's coming from a medical background, but as now a businessman, what's really the the gauge that you're getting from this this region and Chinese market? Yeah, it's interesting. If you looked at AI in China over the last few years, you're seeing some some work and some development, but it wasn't seen as a specific leader in AI. Well, government initiatives have certainly changed that, right? In 2018, the government really stated a case that by 2030, they will be number one in the world in contribution to, to AI specifically, and healthcare is one of their four pillars, if you will, so it's important for us. Uh, the second thing that they did this last year is that they overcame the UK. So they're number two as far as healthcare expenditure, specifically around AI. So from our perspective, we are in the right place to be able to help to feed into that population. So that's the money flowing into healthcare technology in the Chinese market. But how is that really being executed on the, on the ground? Is there anyone who can tell us you know, how the money is really being put to use? I, I, you may answer that question in a different way or in another level than I do. What I do know is, is that when we look at the, at the distribution of GMP, 17% uh, US and only 5% in China dedicated to healthcare. However, if you go to the US and you want to do a case, you may have one hour of a patient time and two hours of reporting time. That's a travesty. It's because of the distribution process and what happens in having to streamline, which we're going to be doing in China. China's caught on to that. They're now doing regionalization to make sure that we have local lo in individual locations that we can start looking at patient records. What are we doing for diagnosis? How are we ensuring that we have one centralized archive for patient data? Mm -hmm. That's really unique. So China is gaining strength based upon that. Do you think there is an extra advantage, Serena, for example, to the Chinese players or other companies in this region or in, 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 in some of the emerging economy because they didn't really have very developed infrastructure in healthcare to begin with? Uh, yes, I saw the advantage coming from like uh, two sides. And first of all, I think uh, because a lot of area uh, is, uh, you know, still underdeveloped. So there was a lot of uh, potential opportunities and the government is really uh, has their focus to improving uh, the quality of health, the quality, the avail availability of different uh, treatment and drugs in China. So they were being very supportive. And from the other side, I've been observing a um, very interesting point is um, because of the underdevelopment, especially some of the, in the some rural areas, even the physicians, um, you know, they are actually very keen to learn uh, the new technologies. So I think the, you know, acceptance level from the you know young physicians in China is pretty high. They they want to try the new technology because they feel like they're so eager to learn. I think from that part is also uh, China's you know uh, advantage. So state level push. Yeah. And also more willingness to adopt these new technological advancements. Then my next question is, what are some of the upcoming trends looking into 2020 and years beyond? What are some of the new buzzwords in the healthcare space in terms of the technology, um, you know, technological advancements? Um, I think there were a lot of uh, early stage investment and early stage co companies uh, working on this area. So what we've been absorbing, uh, first of all, we've talked about diagnostics. Uh, they were like a genetic uh, diagnostics and uh, also medical imaging. Um, I think besides that also the technology is kicking in drug development, personalized medicine as well. Um, I think also in the treatment. So uh, I've been Matting some companies doing like a robotic surgery, and then uh, especially on some large diseases like lung, so they are really collecting uh, real good data, uh, you know, from what they are doing. So I think that those kind of uh, you know 
different areas we've, we've been observing like a very rapid development. So you mentioned robotic surgeries because at this point, Rob, we're hearing a lot about diagnosis, uh, remote diagnosis, boosted connectivity. Are we getting getting into that area now? That's that's some of the excitement about what's happening in AI for the next decade. Now we have an introduction of 5G communications, right? We could even do a little bit of this on the robotic surgery on looking at virtual surgeries. But when we think about what has to change is that we've got this dis distributed method of reaching the patient population. So from our side, it's really critical we get out to that patient population. But you may have an expert that is in Shanghai that should be doing the work, but this individual has no way of getting there, right? So we take that distributed model and we get it much more streamlined into the normal patient model, which is in the institution, but ensure that we're able to use what we can and our advantage is now with huge data that we've already accumulated, uh, AI diagnostics that are already in place and we can even get more data around that, and then finally even predictive value, right? So maybe we know when an event is going to happen in cardiac care or even in our case, we're looking at early breast cancer detection. Uh, but if in fact we are now monitoring more in the home and then being able to work in local centers and using virtual reality, augmented reality to do surgery, that is all capable now, especially with 5G being implemented. And with all these possibilities of earlier diagnosis, maybe we don't really need uh, robotic surgeries down the road or need fewer of it. Um, I want to talk about the timeline, though, for all these scenarios of robotic surgeries. What kind of timeline are we thinking, for example? You mean uh, in terms of development? Yeah, for the actual uh, scenario of us being able to get to robotic surgeries, the scenario that Rob was just talking about, how far have we come? Uh, it's already started in some area for the robotic surgery. Um, you know, some companies really doing good uh, in the U.S. in this area. But I think in China, the development is just getting started. Um, but we see very exciting progresses. I think next three to five years, we would see more prototype to kick in in Asia or in China. And yeah. we mentioned data, and I want to get into that, perhaps the regulatory side of things, because we've got deeply, deeply personal data. Is there enough conversation about the regulatory side in the Chinese market, for example? Uh, not yet, but there was a warning uh, sign from, you know, there was a genetic baby issue last year in China, so the government get uh, quite concerned about it. So before that, there was no regulation at all, but uh, it seems like something is in discussion, um, especially about genetic or this kind of gene data, the government has become more and more cautious now, just trying to tighten up uh, the regulation in the future. Mm. Rob, what do you think? Because we're talking about the technologies being developed so that we can send our personal med medical data via mobile, and it's somehow going somewhere to doctors in you know, in remote areas. How do you think we should handle all these massive amount of medical data? Well, we, we clearly need government regulation, and I, I'm always hesitant to say that, but the reality is is that we've got a very distributed data right uh, base now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the right thing that they're doing now is to look at regionalization and how we can start looking at the privacy of data. Mm -hmm. uh, everything we do is anonymized, so anything that gets uh, analyzed is always uh, anonymous data. Uh, but you need to be at that point where the data is very transparent and that the value of the data is such that you want to put the time and effort into the security of that data. So there are a number of initiatives now uh, around just looking at the basics. You know, let's email versus fax and let's have secure email. Ironic, but we should have done that 20 years ago or 10 years ago, right? Um, the, the, the verbal record, can the verbal record go directly into the patient record? So do we have to actually have all of this conversation and then write it down and the physicians have to spend another hour or two doing that? Or can it all be automated? WeChat's in 38,000 hospitals right now, right? Voice recognition from iFly Tech is one of the largest, that's one of our business partners, one of the largest recognized tools. They also do very smart front AI. So if you come into an institution, you might be speaking to a person, or you may be speaking to a Harvard past AI engine that says, we know how to help you to get around this institution. 
and to better route that process. So all of that is happening today, and it is happening around AI. Uh, and it is really important that we come together as uh, not just China, uh, but as a global community and understand privatization of data is critical, uh, but the ability to be able to energize out on AI and start driving new initiatives, even for predictive outcomes, is critical as well. Yeah, I mean, that privacy uh, front is, of course, the, the crucial part of this conversation. To wrap up this conversation, I want to get your thoughts on perhaps some of the missing opportunities that, that we don't really talk enough about that gets missed in the headlines. Serena? Yeah, I, uh, well, I just uh, thinking about one of the Chinese company now is doing, uh, using AI, um, you know, to shorten the initial time of like when you're meeting doctors, the first people you talk is actually a mach machine. And then the AI is going to decide it after talk to you, which doctor uh, you, you're going to see afterwards. So basically, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, in China, there was huge volume uh, traffic in the big, uh, you know, hospitals. So that's really safe time for patients who are visiting the hospital and improving um, the, you know, efficiency. I think that's also a very interesting area. Mm, what yeah. about you, Rob? We're really excited about the mass population that can't see, if you will, the normal institutions. We think about our economy and it's, you know, and it's a very solid economy, but the reality is, is that two-thirds of the population in Asia do not have great quality access or the economic capability of doing so. So what we are doing with institutions in China and Thailand, as well as looking at doing something here in Hong Kong, but going to the outreach locations where very smart, if you will, you know, both physicians who have to head up the decision process, but also technology goes out to the mass population, delivering it out to the mass population. Two or three or 400 women in our case with 70% density, which is very difficult from an imaging perspective to see, that's what we see. If in fact we can get out to that community and we can do general OBGYN exams and then have that information translated immediately back to a smart institution, and if there's something need that, that needs to be done in, in further investigation, we have all the accents of the intelligence. So from our side, it's really getting out to that mass population. We'll be screening hundreds of people on a daily basis. There's only one ultrasound system or one mammography system, and it's challenged by density. So there from our side, we're really here to say, how do we shift from here where we feel pretty comfortable uh, to out there in the mass population where they zero have any access, and it's important that we find everything we do from a diagnostic, especially from the case of cancer earlier. Mm. Oh, really quickly though, tell us how AI element is really helping your IT broad technology. It's automated. So we, we look specifically at pathology and we know that the difference of actual cancer and non-cancer is diverse. We've done five years of work out of Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, one of the most educated machine learning institutions. So the beauty of what we do for a physician is that today they're looking at fuzzy images and trying to make an interpretation. Right. We go to them and say yes or no, not an interpretation, yes or no, at the same level that they see for the normal diagnostic, but even better in the case of the 70% of density. So AI is really critical in many applications where the data is enough and the, and the interpretation does not have to be because the algorithms will automatically work against, in our case, against the pathology, the actual surgical outcome of patients. Rob, Serena, thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation today. Very insightful.